In early 20th century Philadelphia, black and white dock workers defied segregation and racism, organised themselves and took action to win better pay and conditions. One of them, Ben Fletcher, became one of the most important labour activists in the United States. Feared by employers, surveilled by the FBI, thrown in jail and then largely forgotten until recently. This is Working Class History. Through the workers' blood shall run There can be no greater power anywhere beneath the sun Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one But the union makes us strong Solidarity forever Solidarity Before we get started, just a quick reminder that our podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Our supporters fund our work and in return get exclusive early access to podcast episodes, add free episodes, bonus episodes, free and discounted merchandise and other content. For example, our Patreon supporters can listen to both parts of this double episode now, as well as an exclusive bonus episode. Join us or find out more at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Link in the show notes. This is the first part of a double episode about the most important US labour organiser that you've probably never heard of, Ben Fletcher, who was a member and activist in the Industrial Workers of the World Union, known as the Wobblies. I am from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the city of brotherly love. While that might sound facetious, it is a fact nevertheless that a little more unity has prevailed there during the present maelstrom of labour oppression than in most cities. These were Ben's words penned in January 1920 from inside Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas and sent to one Athelia Campbell of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. His words are read by Alki, a wobbly historian, retail worker and YouTuber. The IWW is very strongly represented in the marine transportation industry of Philadelphia. We have about 7,000 longshoremen and seamen there. Like yourself, I suppose I was born a rebel, though I have had varied experiences, some which would have caused me to ally myself with the employing class if I could have forgotten the place from which I sprung. While I do not countenance against the working class striking at the ballot box, I am firmly convinced that foremost and historical mission of labor is to organize as a class, industrially train and develop our own technicians, scientific men and women, and thereby prepare ourselves to successfully continue the operation of industry when capitalist society dies will it be of dry rot. Of course, any political gain, redress, or concession that we can secure is the meanwhile and should not be ignored. And so political unity follows industry unity, being its shadow. We go marching onward to certain victory. We are living in stirring times. Given Fletcher's importance, people may ask why he's been forgotten. This question is addressed by Robin D.G. Kelly, who wrote the foreword for an excellent recent book, Ben Fletcher, The Life and Times of a Black Wobbly. And Robin Kelly's essay is very interesting in that he also talks about how essentially the left has been whitewashed. Um, And that word is really a good word in this context, because what it means is non-white people have been eliminated from or made invisible to. Whereas in fact, during the 19-teens and 20s, and then ever since, African-Americans, other black people and other people of color have been instrumental to the communist movement, the sort of syndicalist anarchist movement and other movements on the left. This is Peter Cole, professor of history at Western Illinois University and author of the aforementioned book on Fletcher. It's a really great book. We highly recommend you get hold of it. And as luck would have it, it's available in our online store. Link in the show notes. So Ben Fletcher is the most important African-American who was ever in the IWW and one of the most important black labor leaders and really black leftists in American history. But he's almost entirely unknown, even among those who know a lot about the history of American labor, the history of American radicalism, forgetting about the history of worldwide labor and radicalism. Uh, but Fletcher is wildly unknown, yeah? Um, but I'm suggesting, I have suggested, that that's a mistake for those of us who are interested in capitalism and the struggle against it, but also racial capitalism, that sort of that these twin concepts that sort of are really foundational and in constant conversation and you can't really separate them. 
Well, let us sort of dig deep into why it would be that an African-American, a working class man from Philadelphia, became a Wobbly and then how he helped to lead really the most successful interracial union of his time. So who was Ben Fletcher and where did he come from? So Ben Fletcher was born Benjamin Harrison Fletcher. At that time, 1890, the president of the United States was a man named Benjamin Harrison, who was a white man like every president except one, and uh, was a Republican. For those of us who know our U.S. history well and political history, since Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party was the quote unquote party that freed the slaves, which is correct, if a bit general, most Every single African-American was a Republican, and so Fletcher was named after the Republican president at the moment. That's actually normal. Fletcher's parents were both migrants from uh, the South, from Virginia, his mother from Virginia or maybe Maryland, his father from a place called the Eastern Shore of Virginia, which is a maritime province. Pete has been unable to find conclusive proof one way or the other, but given their location and the time, it's most likely that both of Fletcher's parents were born into enslavement. This was ended after the Civil War in 1865. Uh, Moved to Philadelphia, um, which is a city sort of in the lower north, you might think of it. Ben Fletcher was born in Philadelphia in 1890, uh, native Philadelphian. And, uh, you know, his parents went on to have a number of other kids. Actually, his mother lost several children at birth and his mother died um, when he was in his teens. And they moved around a lot, like typical working class or poor people, multiple apartments that they rented. Uh, But Fletcher, by around 1910, 20 years old, was a working man, never graduated high school, which would have been normal at that time. And that's sort of when we can pick him up. Other than that, it's just a little tidbits from census records. But in 1910 around, he joins the Industrial Workers of the World. He also joins around that time the Socialist Party of the United States, led by Eugene Debs. And uh, why is actually a sort of a fascinating question, which... We can guess at, perhaps in an educated way, but not for sure, because he never actually makes clear why or when, precisely 1910, 1911. The IWW was a union unlike any other at that time. Founded in 1905, unlike nearly all other unions in the US, it sought to organise all workers, regardless of race, nationality, gender, craft or industry, into one big union to fight for better conditions now, and to take over society and build a new world, run by workers for workers. We give an introduction to them in our podcast episode 6, also with Peter Cole. Debs was one of the founders of the IWW who also served as the presidential candidate for the Socialist Party, receiving, at its peak, over 900,000 votes, about 6% of the total. Although Debs didn't actually put too much stock in electoralism or leaders in general, believing it much more important for workers to organise themselves. In one of his famous quotations, he declared that he was, quote, not a labour leader, end quote, and said that, quote, I would not be a Moses to lead you into the promised land, for someone would lead you out again, end quote. But back to Fletcher. We know he's working manual labour jobs, including on the waterfront in Philadelphia, which was one of the largest and busiest ports in the country in that time, and Philadelphia, the third largest city in the country at that time, and had the largest African-American population outside of the South at that time, and also has a long history of being a large, quote-unquote, free Black community, going back to the 18th century. And so Fletcher is a part of this urban Black milieu, but he wouldn't have lived in an all-Black neighborhood, although people clustered together. In South Philadelphia, which is where he lived for most of his life, there were many, many Italians, immigrants, many, many East European Jewish immigrants, many Irish immigrants, as well as maybe second and third generation Irish Americans, some Poles, some Lithuanians, Anglo-Americans. And so it was Philadelphia is actually pretty physically small. And so it would have been a very diverse area. And even street by street, According to census records, he lived in places where on the same block as he lived were people different than him. In other words, it was not racially segregated in the way it later came to be. Um, And he would have been able to even walk to the waterfront, right? Like uh, because it's a small city and because you could save five or 10 cents by walking a mile or two instead of taking the streetcar. Um, He would have very likely walked to the Delaware River, which was the main river on the east side of the city. The other side of the Delaware is New Jersey. 
and uh, he would have lived and worked. And along the way, he um, joined the IWW, uh, joined the Socialists, and a few years later helped found uh, the union, uh, the branch of the IWW that I sort of focus upon. So that was Fletcher's life, which would have been a very typical life of a black Philadelphian at that time. Of course, the experience of black residents would always be substantially different from that of white residents. They definitely suffered from racism. Um, Most jobs were simply denied to black people. Uh, Most employers simply didn't hire black men or women for them. And the famous African-American intellectual and activist W.E.B. Du Bois' first book was actually called The Philadelphia Negro, published in the 1890s. And um, he basically argued that the, the, the number one factor that defines the experience of black people in Philadelphia was racism. And so Fletcher would have, that would have been his milieu in which he grew up in. Soon after joining the IWW, scraps of information about Fletcher started to appear in the union's press. So Ben Fletcher was already in the IWW no later than 1911, and he shows up in 1911 and 1912, and then in early 1913 in IWW publications. One of them is called Solidarity, right? Another is called The Industrial Worker. So that we know that Fletcher was already in the IWW and already was an activist, that he's named by others who are writing reports about what's going down in Philadelphia, that actually he wrote several short pieces for IWW publications that came out nationally or were read nationally and even internationally. And we know he was considered to be a really great speaker. Um, One of the first documents about Ben Fletcher is one of his fellow workers, as Wobblies refer to each other, uh, as being a sort of a dynamic speaker. And he very likely was among the very few African-Americans in Philadelphia who were in the IWW, although we don't really have demographic information on their membership. We generally know that there weren't many black people in the Wobblies at that time. And we also know, like I said, that he was a longshoreman, um, or at least some of the time that you could go down to the waterfront on the Delaware or to the west on the Schuylkill River. And if you were a man, and this time it was an all-male occupation, and if you were um, willing to work hard physically, manual labor, that was dangerous. And actually also, or if you're willing to sort of accept low wages, But if you had nothing better, there were thousands and thousands of men, immigrants, migrants, local people who would have basically seen to pick up jobs where even though you don't have skills, you might have enough labor and uh, savvy to sort of lift and load cargo in and out of ships. The first significant industrial action which is recorded Fletcher took part in began in 1913. And so in May of 1913, dock workers in Philadelphia go on strike. They go on strike because they need or want to raise. Uh, They also have other demands, but as in the majority of cases, strikes primary demand was usually about making more money. We know that um, before the strike, that there was not a chapter of the IWW representing dock workers. There were already wobbly locals in the city of Philadelphia, but in other industries. The largest industry actually in Philadelphia is textiles. Lots of people worked in textile factories in Philadelphia and elsewhere in the Northeast, like New York and Massachusetts, but these were segregated and excluded black workers. So black workers had to seek employment in other industries, like on the docks. And so African-Americans work on the waterfront. About a third of dock workers in in Philadelphia in that era were black. Maybe a third were Irish and or Irish-American. And maybe about a third were other sorts of European immigrants, but particularly Polish and Lithuanian people. Some of those were Jews. And so May 1913, workers go on strike. That strike shuts down the waterfront, meaning that ships that are um, in the Delaware River are stuck, right? They're not going to get loaded or unloaded for several weeks. And we know that in the midst of that strike, the IWW and representatives of the American Federation of Labor, which has a dock worker union as well, called the International Longshoremen's Association, ILA, both apparently show up to try to convince strikers to join their union and then for that union to lead that strike. Now, uh, the AFL's dock worker union, the ILA, actually represents workers in most every other port in the country. Not necessarily all the workers, but they are present. Now, while the IWW had dock worker members in Canada, as we talk about in our episode 52, the union didn't have any dock worker members in the US at this time. However, in the middle of this strike in May 1913, 
workers who are on strike, there was approximately 4,000 of them, voted to affiliate with the IWW and then were given a charter, right? And they become known as Local 8. They're not the eighth union in the IWW. It's The numbers are confusing, but it probably deals with that they might have been the eighth charter, perhaps in marine transportation. Nevertheless, Local 8 is the name that we know them by. Fletcher is actually present, but he's not named as a leader. Uh, when we look at, uh, because the strike was so important to the local economy, the local newspapers covered the strike every day. And we also have other sorts of documentation. But um, in the aftermath of this two-week strike, workers win. Employers concede to the demands of the workers, which is to grant a raise, but also to actually not discriminate against hiring strikers or union members. And we know that by the end of the strike, that the Employers Association was negotiating with Local 8 and that the Local 8 Negotiating Committee intentionally had representatives of every ethnic group that had significant numbers on the waterfront. So from their inception, this diverse group of strikers chose to affiliate with the IWW, which was this radical anti-capitalist militant union. And we know this union was anti-racist. If we just read their constitution, they make it literally the first Article one is that no one will be denied membership based on race, creed, or color. We know that Fletcher is there. It's very reasonable to conclude that Fletcher was crucial to convincing those 1,500 or so black people that the IWW was legit. The ILA in other ports often does not organize African Americans or puts them in all black locals and, and puts white people in a separate segregated local. And we know that the strike wins, grants a raise. And then we know that the IWW Local 8 immediately pushes to integrate the gangs, i.e. the workplaces on the waterfront. Before the strike, as was the case in most American workplaces, jobs, but also work within job sites was often segregated by race, ethnicity, and gender. And so there would have been an Irish gang, a Polish gang, an Italian gang, etc. And there would definitely have been a separate black gangs. Employers in the US would frequently encourage racial and ethnic divisions in their workforce and use this to discourage organisation. And then they would use workers of different ethnicities to break each other's strikes. So to try to avoid this happening, the IWW would attempt to break down ethnic and racial divisions within the workforce. The Wobblies, Local 8, immediately says, we are going to integrate our gangs, which is incredibly radical and incredibly unusual for the United States in 1913. And we know that Fletcher immediately is being sort of touted before, but also after this moment as being the leader of Local 8. Very quickly, Local 8 doesn't just, in other words, say that they believe in racial equality. Very quickly, Local 8 demonstrates through its policies, including pushing employers to sort of change how they do their work, this sort of integration. This would, of course, be 50 years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 ended legal segregation based on race in the United States. And many unions also were dragging their feet on racial equality, both in the 19-teens and for decades after. Right? And so very quickly, we see Local 8 demonstrating power, demonstrating some material gains for the members, but also inserting this other matter into the conversation, you might say, even though it wasn't required by anyone. They just pushed this issue because it seemed that the IWW generally and Local 8 particularly put this front and center and that Fletcher was immediately the most prominent African-American and, and for that matter, actually the most prominent member of Local 8 in the entire IWW. In addition to Dockers, boatmen joined Local 8 as well. Boatmen are basically responsible for getting boats and safely connecting them to moorings in the docks. After the May 1913 strike of dock workers, boatmen went on strike in autumn. Some employers gave in to the workers' demands, while others didn't. After the dispute, authorities tried to crack down on the workers. Here's a short article written by Fletcher about how workers tried to defend themselves. In it, he mentions miner and IWW leader Big Bill Haywood. Like every other reading we're including in these episodes, this extract is from Peter's book. Another victory was scored by the IWW last week in Philadelphia. McKelvey, Lou, and Wilmot were liberated from the capitalist hellhole Moyamensing Prison, February 19th. 
Although sentenced to one year on probation, we are more than confident that the subservient lickspittles of the shipping trust will not dare lay their hands again on these fellow workers for that account. McKelvey, Lou, and Wilmot were convicted December 13, 1913 on a charge of mentally conspiring to beat scabs and get Tucker. Tucker is one of the ship owners who refused to grant the demands of the workers during the boatman strike last year. A defense conference was organized shortly after their imprisonment. For obvious reasons, the conference at first pursued the method of watchful waiting. The judge, a faithful lieutenant of the parasites, took advantage of the conference's policy. He kept McKelvey and the other two fellow workers in jail for nine weeks, while making up his mind as to what sentence should be pronounced upon them, without arriving at any conclusion. The up-till-now, somewhat slumbering rebels began to feel aggravated. The conference changed its tactics. The IWW began to manifest itself. A local newspaper sympathizing with the working class gave publicity to the case, arousing public sentiment. The different labor organizations readily answered the call for support, but the most essential factor that contributed to the release of the three fellow workers is the mighty weapon possessed by the waterfront slaves, the Marine Transport Workers Union of the IWW. The judge before sentencing the prisoners questioned Tucker as to his feelings towards McKelvey, Lou, and Wilmot, to which he replied that he no longer held any grievance against them. The reason for it is as follows. As it reached the ear of the shipping trust that Bill Haywood was coming to Philadelphia March 1st to have a consultation with the marine transport workers relative to the imprisonment of the three fellow workers, Tucker's heart suddenly expanded to make room for a Christian magnanimity that was traveling with lightning speed toward his oracles and ventricles. This is what labor can do everywhere if organized. Make the bosses magnanimous. Local eights organizing across racial and ethnic lines was particularly important in Philadelphia, which has a long history of deep internal divisions. Going back to the um, 1800s, African Americans had often worked in the maritime industries of Philadelphia. It's really a port city, even though it's on a river as opposed to on an ocean, right? It's about 100 miles downriver from Philadelphia to get out to the Chesapeake Bay. But even in the mid 1800s, there's a lot of racial tensions in the city of Philadelphia, in particular between working class Irish and working class African Americans, including multiple different incidents before the Civil War of violence in which Irish and Irish Americans perpetrate violence against black people including in waterfront jobs, because those jobs are valuable. Even though they pay badly, they pay better than nothing. And so there's a long history, actually, going back into the 1840s, at least, of racial tensions between working class blacks and working class Irish. And there's simultaneously persecution of Irish immigrants by the Anglo-American majority, including in Philadelphia. In fact, the worst, the the deadliest riot in Philadelphia before the Civil War was uh, one in which Protestant Philadelphians killed 20 Irish Catholic Philadelphians in 1844. And so what we've got is a city that's rife with tensions, right? And simultaneously uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, a major increase in immigration to the United States, including port cities like Philadelphia. So um, there's simultaneously an increasingly diverse local population in a country where racism is the norm, but also xenophobia, where immigrants um, are often sort of treated hostily by Americans, even though immigration is quote unquote open and generally speaking, employers love immigration for two reasons. One, it increases the population numbers. A larger labor supply means you can pay workers less. And two, employers time and time again in Philadelphia and other cities would play different ethnic and racial groups off of each other, right? And so we see this actually repeatedly during strikes that the local eight pulls off, where workers are ethnically and racially diverse, and employers will try to make a pitch to one group say the Irish, say the Italians or the Poles, in order to sort of peel them off, right? In other words, using ethnicity and race as a wedge to weaken workers. Now, if you're clever, you think to yourself, I'm smarter than the boss. I know that they're going to do this. Unfortunately, even though you might know it, the prejudices are not just coming from the top down, not just from the elite. Unfortunately, working class people also have some prejudices. And so Local 8, from its inception, We'll have to struggle with this issue, right? Um, How to sort of overcome the mainstream racism and xenophobia in Philadelphia and across the country. Generally speaking, the IWW is committed to doing so, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's easy. That's never not an issue. And in the later, after World War I, in fact, 
racism will re-emerge in the country, but also on the Philadelphia waterfront. That's a bit later, right? Um, but uh, we're mindful that it's, there's people like Fletcher who are sort of crucial to sort of keeping this together. And there's lots of evidence, including in my book, of how Fletcher talked, you know, that he was giving talks all the time um, and that he was considered to be very good at appealing to workers, not just black workers, to explain the logic, right, of being interracial and that essentially racism weakens workers and therefore disempowers them. But it's really essential to the whole story. I'm mindful that in 2020, Racism and diversity continue to be divisive issues, right? Um, including among unions and working people. To me, constantly, the lessons of the 19 teens in Ben Fletcher's book seem to resonate um, with people a century on. After the first big dispute, Local 8 really got busy trying to organise on the docks. And they did so in a democratic way, under the control of the workers themselves. After Local Aid is established, Fletcher is not the only leader, and the IWW nationally and as well as locally was committed to democracy. So that meant that you could only be elected for one year at a time, and you never were paid more than anyone who worked in the industry that you toiled in. And so these organizers, like really most members of the IWW, are true believers in the cause, right? Everybody who's a member is sort of an activist, a bit less so if you're just uh, in Local Aid. Once the union is established, if you want to work on the waterfront, you have to actually be a member of Local 8. And one of the ways that Local 8 organized is fascinating. It's not unique to them by any means. You know, after the Local 8 got established, they did a bunch of things to the benefit of workers. One of the things they did is they radically changed the hiring process. Before Local 8, the system was nicknamed the shape up. So that if you wanted a job, you'd go down to maybe the pier. In some cases, in some port cities, there might be specific locations where workers who wanted to get hired would be picked by the boss, right? Or hiring bosses, plural. And, you know, there could be 200 people who show up for 40 jobs. How does the boss pick? Well, the boss picks who they like, who they know, uh, who's among the same ethnic group, same racial group, the same religious group, who is willing to pay a bribe or a kickback to the hiring boss, et cetera, right? And so in other words, from the jump, you see your fellow workers as rivals as opposed to friends. Local 8 obliterates the shape up. Dock workers hated the shape up. Everybody hated the shape up. If you were a worker, um, there was just nothing you could do about it. However, once Local 8 gets established, the system changes. Now you have to call the Local 8 hall. Telephones already existed, right? So you call the hall and you say, I want 40 guys to come down to Pier 20 tomorrow to load coal. And Local 8 picks members who are in good standing to sort of go down to the hall. And they also, of course, would pick a diverse workforce to do that. They would issue buttons on a monthly basis if you paid your dues. If you didn't pay your dues, which were very low, but nevertheless, you had to pay them, then you got a new button, January 1914, Local 8. That way also, because there's thousands of guys who work on the waterfront, you don't know everybody, you have to, you look around, you make sure that everybody in your group has your button. If not, you're not a, a loyal member. Well, the boss, of course, doesn't give a crap, right? Uh, who's paid up and who's not. Local eight members would constantly be enforcing basically their own ranks. And they would tell the bosses, you can't be hiring people otherwise. They have to be wobblies. In true IWW fashion, if bosses didn't do what the workers wanted, the union would respond not by filing a grievance, but by taking direct action on the job. Famously, in the story, uh, one interview that was done with a black dock worker named Abraham Moses, right, who said, well, you know what the local eight would do if um, the boss tried to hire non-wobblies? They'd wait a few hours into the shift, and then in the middle of a shift, without announcing to the boss, they would basically put some cargo in slings and pull up uh, the ropes, yeah, the lines, and sort of cut the ropes or um, attach them and leave all this cargo hanging in the air and walk off the ships and say, until you are willing to basically do what we tell you to do, then we're not going to work. And well, the boss is uh, sort of faced with a situation. You either listen to the workers and get your work done or you're stuck, right? And in the industry of shipping where time is money, that's a very powerful tactic, right? And so the Wobblies, not just in Philadelphia by any means, but on the waterfronts, would use these direct action tactics, sometimes nicknamed quick strikes or quickie strikes, where they would be able to sort of prove their power, 
to the bosses and the bosses would therefore basically back off, right? And we know that the bosses hated the IWW as they did everywhere, but we also know that they continued to basically play with the Wobblies because Wobblies had enough power to basically maintain their ranks, but also sort of impose their will to some extent on employers. We also know that Fletcher was instrumental to this in not just Philadelphia. In addition to these everyday guerrilla actions on the job, there were also other significant disputes on the docks which broke out. For example, on the 27th of January 1915, a mass meeting of grain trimmers in the port of Philadelphia voted to go on strike, demanding a pay increase from 20 cents an hour to 60 cents an hour, with 90 cents an hour for overtime and $1.20 per hour for work on Sundays and public holidays. Most employers soon caved in and agreed to increases up to 40 cents per hour base pay, 60 cents overtime and 80 cents on Sundays and holidays. But one employer, Chaz Taylor, refused to permit the increase and instead locked out union workers. So the IWW continued to strike. Fletcher wrote a report about it for Solidarity and recounted a visit by Irish socialist James Larkin, who addressed a crowd of striking workers. He arrived on the following Tuesday and spoke that evening. In an able and eloquent manner, he portrayed the conditions of the workers generally and clearly showed how, by industrial organization on the job, it was possible for workers to gain control of industry. His recital of how the marine transport workers of Dublin, after striking for 20-odd weeks, were forced to give up the struggle and go back to work, apparently defeated, yet won the strike in a few hours when they got back to work again by practicing kakani, that is, going easy brought round after round of applause, which bodies no good for Chas and Taylor if the strikers go back to the docks defeated. Fellow worker Larkin pledged the support of the Irish transport workers if necessary, and promised to present the situation in the support of dockers across the sea with the request that they hold themselves in readiness, and refuse to discharge any grain or cargo from ships loaded by scab labour. Practicing kakani basically means launching a go slow. In this dispute, a few days after Larkin met the strikers, Amidst high unemployment and easy availability of scab labour, the IWW decided to go back to work without having achieved the new rate at Taylor, but instead, quote, renew the fight at some more favourable time. Having got agreement from Taylor to discharge all of the scab replacement workers and take back all the union workers. In addition to organising on the docks where he worked, Fletcher also travelled around the country for the IWW, public speaking and organising. Thanks to his recollections, as well as some um, documentary evidence in Wobbly newspapers, as well as the federal government spies, he was regularly sent up and down the Atlantic coast. So he was in Norfolk, Virginia, a major port, Baltimore, New York City occasionally, Providence, Rhode Island, not a huge port, but nevertheless, southern New England, and Boston. Fletcher was dispatched from 1913, really 1912 through 1917, on a regular basis, he would um, travel up and down the coast, probably by rail, but maybe by ship, to organize more dock workers and more black workers specifically. Um, so for example, in Providence, Rhode Island, interesting as those of us who know sort of Southern New England, there's a lot of Portuguese, more Portuguese in that part of the U.S. than other places. And some of those Portuguese people are of African descent, especially those who are from Cape Verde and the Azores. And racism being racism, right? Um, black people who are black Portuguese were limited job opportunities. A lot of those people in Rhode Island also worked on the waterfront. Fletcher sent up there, right, to essentially prove, because it's one thing for the Wabis to say that we believe in racial equality, but... Unlike the ILA, or most labor unions at that time, they could actually demonstrate through Philadelphia and often Fletcher that the Wobblies are committed to um, Black inclusion and Black equality. And so Fletcher is really the considered to be not the best, I wouldn't say that, but, you know, a premier organizer, right, um, and was trying to constantly overcome the ethnic and racial and national divisions that plagued the American working class. That also was the case in Baltimore, where Fletcher was repeatedly sent, where there was a significant black population, but also Irish and Poles who didn't necessarily get along with each other. Typically, wobbly speaking engagements would involve setting up a pitch on a street corner and just starting to speak to people, normally after having advertised the meeting at that particular spot. The IWW waged fierce battles for the right to free speech in public places, which we spoke about in our episode 6. 
Sometimes, however, Fletcher's meetings could get a bit hairy. In early 1917, he's in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, Norfolk, of course, is in the South and uh, in the so-called Jim Crow South, right? And so more overtly racist and more actually racist, perhaps, than Pennsylvania. Fletcher, according to reports, stories he tells, he's giving a speech one day, say in early 1917 in Norfolk, where uh, hecklers, uh, white hecklers, who might be just provocateurs of a sort, um, start asking him provocative questions about his opinion about interracial sex, which is sort of a no-go zone and actually illegal for black and white people to marry in the state of Virginia. That was actually the famous 1967 Loving v. Virginia Supreme Court case that overturned bans against mixed-race marriage. Fletcher happened to be a very dark-skinned black man which is to say that he probably had less white blood in him than many other African-Americans who probably were lighter skinned due to the rape of black women who had been enslaved by their white masters. And so that all comes around because when this heckler asks Fletcher's opinion about what do you think about interracial marriage, he responded um, in his brief explanation. He said something to the effect of, well, I'm about the darkest guy in this room around here. It was open air. And that uh, turning it back on him, pointing out and going, don't ask me about interracial marriage. White men are the ones who, of course, are sort of the ones engaging in interracial sex all the time, even if it's against the will of black women. Well, it might have been that sort of response, or it might have been the fact that he was a radical labor organizer. But according to Fletcher, he heard that he was threatened with a lynching, um, that he might be killed. And so friends of his in Norfolk quickly got him aboard a ship to Boston. And so in early 1917, he ends up living in Boston and he starts to organize there. Later that year, Fletcher was up in Providence, Rhode Island. He wrote a brief report of goings on there for an IWW journal. In the port of Providence, Rhode Island, the marine transport workers are getting ready to lock out the scabs and riffraff hereabouts in their second attempt to unionize the port and the IWW. They are determined to win for themselves a better life, working conditions, and more job control, regardless of whether the costs be great or small. Well, that's all the time we have for part one. Next episode, we're going to be looking at how Fletcher ended up in prison, what became of Local 8 on the docks, and what Fletcher did later in life. Our Patreon supporters can listen to that now, as well as a bonus episode with more information about Fletcher's life and his views on the fight against racism. For everyone else, it'll be out in the next couple of weeks. If you haven't already, I would highly recommend getting hold of Peter's book, Ben Fletcher, The Life and Times of a Black Wobbly. It's available from our online store, link in the show notes. And as a listener of this podcast, you can get 10% off it and everything else in our store using the discount code WCHPODCAST. Also check out our friend Alki's YouTube channel where he's got loads of great videos about working class history and workplace organizing. Link to that in the show notes as well. As always, we've got sources for everything we say, links to more info, transcripts and more on the webpage for this episode. Also link in the show notes. Again, this podcast is only made possible because of support from you, our listeners on Patreon. So if you can, please consider joining us for as little as $2 a month at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Supporters get great benefits like exclusive early access to episodes, as well as exclusive bonus episodes, free and discounted books and merch, and more. We know that times are hard right now, so if becoming a patron isn't an option right now, no worries. Please just tell your friends about the podcast share links to our episodes on your social media, and maybe take a second to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks again to all of our Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible. Special thanks to Jazz Hands and Jameson D. Saltzman. Theme tune for these episodes is Solidarity Forever, originally written by Ralph Chaplin and performed by Tom Morello, The Night Watchman. You can buy it or stream it on the links in the show notes. This episode was edited by Louise Barry, Finally, thanks to you for listening. Catch you next time.